<laughs> All right. Well, welcome, Lakemoy family. And uh, hey, man, anybody still like on a high for marriage night? Y'all were here. Who was? Dude, marriage night was amazing. Uh, dude, I just want to say that was last night. And uh, man, just incredible to gather. I think with like five or 6,000 people from Lake Point just investing in marriages. I, I just need you to know this. Like, we are all in. We are all, 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 all in on. We don't just want to build great disciples. We want to build strong families. And it was just an awesome night. Just got to gather and laugh and learn and, and repent. And it was awesome. Now, I do want to say this. Like, I just want to drop a little gift. This is free. It's totally free. So, for the people who missed marriage night, if you missed it, and I, what I heard was like, man, it would have been good. Like, could you just give a little something if like, I'm, we're not married yet, I'm headed towards marriage, okay? I'm gonna do that right now. This is a gold nugget of advice I was given by a mentor. Okay, so this is free. Are y'all, can y'all handle that? Okay, this is free, this is free, okay? Now first, let me do this. So let me, let me talk to the guys first. Guys, when it comes to her wedding day, she has been planning this day her entire life. She got her first like wedding magazine when she was 14. She draped the blanket around her like it was her wedding dress when she was a teenager. She did the towel over her head, it was a little veil, all the stuff. She's been planning this day her whole life. So here's what she need to do, man. When it comes to that day, just stand where she tells you to stand, wear what she tells you to wear and do what she tells you to do. You'll make her the happiest woman in the world, okay? Now I got an amen. Let's see if you amen this. Now, ladies, when it comes to his wedding night, he has been planning this day his whole life. So just stand where he tells you to stand, wear what he tells you to wear, and do what he tells you to do, and you're gonna make him the happiest man in the world. That's it, man, okay. That was free, that was free. <laughs> Acts chapter one. Acts 1. We are, I'm going to shift emotional gears so hard right now. We are going to answer questions today like, can a Christian lose their salvation? If a Christian commits suicide, do they go to hell? How can you be restored from a moral failure uh, deeply after you betray the Lord? Um, we are hitting these things because we are in a series that we're just calling There Is More, where we're preaching through the book of Acts. And, and here's why we're doing this, because it takes the whole word to, to, to make a whole Christian. And so what you'll see as we preach through the book of Acts is I'm gonna be forced as a Bible teacher to get into passages that I would not like naturally choose. But the reason we wanna do this is, again, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. So let's just dive right in. We are in Acts chapter one. We're gonna pick up in verse 15. Let me set the stage because this is a very full passage. This is after Jesus has ascended into heaven. Jesus has promised the filling of the Holy Spirit to all of his disciples. It has not yet happened. Um, at this point, You've got the apostle Peter, the 11 remaining apostles, as you're gonna see in a second, Judas has hanged himself. So 11 apostles, uh, Jesus' mom, Mary, Jesus' aunt is there, and a smattering of about 120 people who started following Jesus during his ministry. It is at this moment that you have these two names that rise to the surface in this passage. Here are the two names. This is very important. It sets the tone for the entire passage and the whole sermon today. The two names are Judas and Peter. These two names dominate this passage. Now, here's why I point this out. These two men have very similar stories. Fascinating. A lot of Bible readers, they miss this. Both of these men were disciples of Jesus. Jesus warned both of them that they would experience catastrophic moral failure and that both of them would betray him. Both of them, they are the only two apostles that Jesus warned each of them, you too will specifically be targeted by Satan before I go to the cross. Both of them fail Jesus on the night of his arrest. Peter experiences the failure of denial. Judas experiences the failure of betrayal. Both of them fail Jesus. Now to this point, these two men have the same stories. 
after this point, radically different outcomes. One of them, Judas, ends up demon-possessed and commits suicide and goes to hell. The other, Peter, ends up, as you'll see next week, ends up spirit-filled. Oh, by the way, demon possession is the satanic counterfeit of being filled with the spirit. Peter is spirit-filled. He is now the human leader of the church on earth, teaching a Bible study to Jesus' mom and brothers and the disciples who did not but deny Jesus. Both of them start the same. They finish very differently. What's the difference? That's this sermon. Now, the reason we need to know the answer to that question is I just need to tell you this. If you have walked with Jesus nearly any time at all in your life, you need to know at some point in your Christian life, you are almost certainly going to experience a catastrophic failure as a disciple of Jesus. Now, you, you may hear that and you're like, man, Pat came to get uplifted. Can't you be more positive? Yes, I am positive that you are going to experience catastrophic failure as a disciple of Jesus at some point. So here's the question. When that happens to you, will you have a Judas future or a Peter future? That's Acts 1 starting in 15. Now check this out. Let me read it. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers. I just love that it's Peter. We're going to come back to this at the very end. Among the believers, a, a group numbering about 120. And he said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had, I love this, it had to. The scripture had to be fulfilled. Why? Because the scriptures are always fulfilled. (laughs) In which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and he shared in our ministry. Now, for us to understand what is being taught here, Let me give you, a lot of us, there's so many things the Bible teaches about Judas that we just gloss over and miss. Let me give you some background about Judas. Judas was one of the 12 disciples called by Jesus. Now, a little confusing. There were actually two disciples named Judas. Judas Iscariot and then Judas, son of James. Extremely unfortunate for the other Judas. Let me just say that. For the rest of that dude's life, it'd be like, you know, you're, hey man, what's your name? Judas. Wow, you know, and his whole life, dude, would have just been going like the other one, not that one, the other one, you know, I'm, I'm Winston Bin Laden, different guy, you know, that kind of thing. That's, so, but there were two, but Ju- Judas Iscariot is the one, one of the 12 original disciples called by Jesus. He is called Iscariot, most people don't know this, that's referring to the region where he grew up. Interestingly, the other 11 disciples were from a region called Galilee, had a lot of Gentile traffic. Because it had a lot of Gentile traffic, Galilee was a lot more secular than sort of the more more urban area, the Judean area that was, like I said, more urban to the south. Just wanna point this out. Judas is the only city boy and he's the one who betrays Jesus. Just wanna point that out. So he's the one from Judea. Now, um, Judas also, as you're gonna see in a second, John 12 says that Judas had a special role among the apostles. He was the functional CFO of Jesus' ministry. So for Jesus Inc., the nonprofit, Judas was the CFO, the money keeper. And Judas, obviously, despite his special role, is the one who betrays Jesus. Now, can I just get this out right right from the gate? That freaks me out. As the senior pastor of Lake Point Church in 2024, it freaks me out that Judas betrays Jesus. Do you know why that freaks me out? Like, check this out. This is Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see it. This says, now I want you tell me the number. Jesus called his how many? How many? 12. His 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. When it says 12 in Matthew 10, that says that this dude, Judas, that betrays Jesus was one of those guys. So think about this. This guy, ne- listen, Judas never missed church for three years. Judas did not have some like lame Josh Howerton preacher opening the scriptures to him every week. Like if Judas had a question, Jesus answered it. Judas not only saw all the miracles of Jesus. Think about this. Judas saw every miracle Jesus did. He saw the feeding of the 5,000. More than that, actually the Bible says that the apostles, Jesus put bread into their hands. They walked around holding out bread. Judas had the bread in his hands, was holding it, watched the bread multiply in his hands as he passed it out. He saw that happen. 
Judas saw the calming of the sea. Judas saw Jesus raise the widow's daughter. Judas was there when Jesus cried out to a full grave, Lazarus, come out. And Jesus wa uh, Judas watched a cadaver get up and, and walk out. Matthew 10 that we just read said that Judas not only saw the miracles, he did them. He went everywhere and with his own two hands, the power of God flowed through Judas to people. He cast out demons, he healed sicknesses, uh, he healed uh, the wounded, all of these things. And yet Judas never surrendered himself to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, how do we know this? I, I, I wanna show you this in the passage. How do we know this? Two ways, a lot of people miss this. We know Judas never believed in Jesus. Fascinating. Never believed in Jesus. Check this out. This is John chapter six. This is early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus says to the apostles, yet there are some of you who do not believe. Now, it's like, oh, well, which one? Well, he tells us, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe who would betray him. Never at any point in Jesus' ministry did Judas believe in Jesus. Now, if you're going, okay, bro, but how do you know he never submitted to the Lordship of Jesus? Here's another thing a lot of people miss. Check this out. This is Matthew 26. So this is like right before Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus is in the upper room. He's doing the last supper with all the apostles. And here's what it says. It says, when it was evening, he reclined at table with the 12. And as they were eating, he said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, as soon as he said this, everybody's like, whoa, what's going on? Like, who, who's, who's gonna do that? I think, you know, I think Peter was probably the first one that like started talking because Peter's like some people, you know, he didn't have any inner voice. He only had an outer voice. He said everything he thought. And so I think Peter just immediately, what he does, check this out. It just says this, Peter, the disciples go, go to the next, they said, and they were sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I? Now you tell me what that word is. Is it I, Lord? Like I said, I think Peter was first. Is it I, Lord? Is it me? You talking about me? And then the Bible says, it says one after another, 11 dudes, is it I, Lord? 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 I'm doing 11. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? 11 guys. But then watch what Judas says. Two verses later, Judas who would betray him answered, is it I, what's that word? Rabbi. And then Jesus said, he, has, he said to him, you have said so. Listen, you must see this. What you have to see, here's the scary news. You can do all the things, you can be at all the things, you can attend all the services, you can do all the ministry, all the things, and you can still not know Jesus and not end up in the kingdom of God. This is what happens to Judas. Every now, I've had somebody ask me this before. So Josh, did Judas lose his salvation? Nope, he faked it. He faked it. Theological question, theological question class. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Here's what I would say, wrong question. Because the Bible says salvation belongs to the Lord. He chose us in him before the foundations of the earth. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So wrong question, here's the right question. Can God lose a Christian? Answer, no, no. And this is what we see here, is that Jesus didn't lose Judas. Judas never gave himself to Jesus. So you can't lose your salvation, but you can fake it. And listen, I'm preaching the word. I'm gonna give you everything that comes from the word. If that happens, Judas faked his salvation. And as a result, Judas ended up in hell. Judas, Judas ended up in hell. You say, how, Josh, how do you know he ended up in hell? The Bible explicitly tells us this. Down later in this passage in Acts chapter one, watch what it says. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. I'm gonna explain this in a second. Show us which of these two, they have to pick two between two dudes who's gonna replace Judas because we need 12 apostles that represent the 12 tribes in the Old Testament because the New Testament kingdom of God is the on earth equivalent of the Old Testament kingdom of God. So we need 12, so they're choosing. Who's gonna fit, fit, play, replace Judas? And then they said, chosen to take over his apostolic ministry. Watch this, which Judas left to go, and this is very sobering, where he belongs. If that does not sober you enough, the book of Matthew, if you're like, Josh, are you sure that's talking about hell? The book of Matthew tells us that Jesus said about Judas, it would be better for that man if he had never been born. Judas definitely 
ended up in hell. Now, I, I got to talk about this because the Bible talks about it. And let me just say something as a pastor that I felt while I was preparing this message. There was a previous generation of preachers, maybe 30, 40 years ago, that might have talked about hell too much, like all like fire and brimstone. I'm going to scare the hell out of you kind of thing. And um, just go with me. <laughs> I may not do that tomorrow. <laughs> and he, <clears throat> Saturday night, you, you, you want to be here on Saturday night. <laughs> <clears throat> So there was a previous generation of pastors that maybe talked about hell too much. Can I just say, my generation of preachers overcorrected and we do not talk about it enough. Guys, this is simply a reality. Let me just say some things to you in a straightforward way. Heaven and hell are real and everyone you meet is going one of those two places forever. Forever. More than that, what I, what, like the burden of my soul preparing for this message not only are those two places real, hell is hot and eternity is long. And what this passage says, I know this sounds crazy. It's like, you're, you're kind of like not allowed to say this in our culture. What this passage says is that some people belong there. They belong there. It's, let me explain it like this. Hell is where they fit. And honestly, they would not want to be in heaven. Now, again, I need to do a... <laughs> a really, really, really hard emotional gear shift for a second. Because the best analogy I've ever been able to come up with this is Disney World. So we're going from hell to Disney World, just track with me. So <clears throat> I, let me just cut to the chase. I, I hate Disney World. I, I just, I, yes, I hear, I see that hand. I, it's not my thing, it's just not my thing. You know, the, the whole commercial is happiest place on earth. You know, and I'm like, might be happy. And then you get in the parking lot and see how much you spent, then you're not happy anymore. And it's just, if you, a lot, some people, you've never been to Disney World and I, I wanna give it a fair shot for you. So if you've never been, here's a, I just wanna be fair to it. Here's what it's like. Imagine you're standing in line at the DMV. That's it, at Disney World, okay? now. <laughs> and the last time I went, <laughs> I just got to say this. Last time I went, it was August 2020, okay? So it was like 120 degrees. It didn't matter where you were. They were like police in the masks. So everywhere you went, it was like you had like a sweaty washcloth on your face in the hundred and you're like smelling every ounce of breath you have under, it's like trapped in this ferocious air bubble, so, and, and, and the thing about, let me just, I, I won't belabor this. The thing about Disney World is it's 120, it's like, the, it's like walking on the surface of the sun is what it's like. It's the only place on earth, it's 120 degrees, you're carrying kids on your back, you're never sitting down, you're sweating all day and you, and you can still gain weight. I do not understand it. It's the only place on earth. Now I do just, again, there are some people, there are some adults who even without kids, they love it. They're called weirdos, they, but they love it. And they just love being there. And you know, I do just, <laughs> let me just, okay. I wanna be for real, for real for a second. I do know some people have created very personal, very meaningful memories at Disney World and, and you love it. And I just want you to hear this, you're wrong. That's all I just wanna say, you're, you're wrong. So here's my point. The whole point of this is what would be, what is heaven for some people, they can't wait to get there. That's like my metaphorical hell. Like they love it. They wanna be there the whole time they're there. They feel very at home. They love the experience. I can't stand one second of it. Now I just, in, in all seriousness, here's my analogy. There are some people who that is exactly what heaven and hell in eternity are like. Listen, Judas didn't wanna have anything to do with a relationship with Jesus when he was on earth. Why in the world would he wanna be in heaven in eternity? Heaven is all about Jesus. It, that's the whole thing. So this is the point. It, what, listen, death changes nothing. It merely eternalizes whatever trajectory of your soul you're already on on earth. If you don't want to have anything to do with Jesus on earth, you will not go where he is for eternity in heaven. Now, I just need to say this. That some people, when I, when I talk about this, you wrestle because you're like, Josh, but I don't want to worship a God who would send people to hell. Can I just say this? That's not the God I worship. 
That's not the God I worship. The God I worship doesn't want anybody to go to hell. First Thessalonians says that our God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. That listen, the God that we worship, he loves you so much. He sent his only son to die on a cross for your sins so that you would never have to experience hell. The God we worship does everything in his power to keep you from going to hell, so much so that he sent his son so that if you go to hell, you gotta step over his dead body to get there. That's the God that we worship. Now, Judas did that. Judas stepped over the body, the crucified body of Jesus, to get to hell. Now, you may be going, well, Josh, I'm confused. Then why did he follow Jesus around for three years? Why would he do that? Well, Let me just say this, here's why this is important because there are many people who follow Jesus around but do not have saving faith in Jesus. There are many, let me just, there are many people who are in church but they're not in Christ and so after they attend church, when they die, they'll go to hell. We have to deal with this reality. In fact, the Bible tells us why Judas hung tight with Jesus for three years. Check this out, this is John 12. It tells us exactly why. So context, this is like the whole deal where the girl like comes and she breaks a little alabaster uh, perfume thing on Jesus' feet, y'all remember that? And does a whole hair thing. So right after that, Judas pipes up and, and this is Judas, one of his disciples, Judas, who would later betray him, objected. Well, why didn't, this, why didn't we sell this perfume uh, and, and sell it and, and take the money and give it to the poor? Because that was worth like a year's wages, what she just did. Now check this out. Then the Bible gives us this. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. If you're gonna lean into any part of this message, you lean in right now, I'm gonna say some hard things. I'm gonna say them because I love you. Judas's real God was his P and L. That, what I'm talking about there, like, that, like I gained 50% of you and lost 50% of you and that's okay. It, it, Judas's real God was his profit and loss statement. You know, if you're unfamiliar, a profit and loss statement is a line in the middle and on one side is everything that's profitable for you your, or your business. On the other side is everything that, that's a loss right now. It's operating in the red. So the, the profits are in the black, the losses are in the red and that was Judas's God. And as long as following Jesus resulted in things on the prophet side in Judas' life, he was in. So when it made him a little money, he was in. When it gained him social standing, he was in. Wanted to stay close to Jesus. When it made him really popular, when he could walk around and heal the sick and crowds wanted to be around Judas, he was all in. But the second Judas realized, I'm never gonna get rich off this guy and he's starting to get in trouble and I might end up in trouble if I'm associated with him. The second he realized following Jesus isn't on the prophet side, it's on the law side, he did what people do with losses, he cut his losses. This is what Judas did. Now listen, man, this right here, I'm gonna say this with sensitivity, that is what is happening in mass in our culture right now. If you are not aware you are right now living in the middle of a generational apostasy. There are more people walking away from the faith, walking away ostensibly from Jesus than any other time in my entire lifetime, maybe any other time in American history. And listen, I'm gonna say something with some sensitivity, but I just need to say it. What they will say is the reason I'm walking away from Jesus is, oh, it's all those terrible Christians or it's the church, the church is so bad or I'm deconverting or man, it's, the, it's all about the politics of Christians or they, you may have family members who look at you and they go, it's actually your fault. You're the reason I walked away. You were this to me and I didn't like that. That's what they say that is not true. The foundational reality of why they walk away, the Bible tells us in 1 John 2, this is what it says. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Anytime somebody walks away from Jesus, Judas or your best friend in 2024, the reason they walked away is that they had never placed saving faith in Jesus and truly been born again. That's the reason. Now listen, let me apply this to you. Here's my fear for you. There are people who are just like Judas, who you're more into the blessings than you are the blesser. And here's the question. When you're not getting gifts from his hand, will you continue to seek his face? 
Here's my reminder. In our culture, in general, check this out, man. In, in this culture, 21st century, century America, right now, I'm not sure how much longer this is gonna be true. It's my job as a pastor to prepare you for the moment when it's not true. But in our culture right now in America, following Jesus actually generally makes your life better. But listen, we don't follow Jesus because he makes life better. We follow Jesus because he is better than life. That's why we follow Jesus. Judas did not have this in him. And you gotta understand this. Half-hearted Christians are the most miserable people in the world. They know enough to feel guilty, but they haven't gone far enough with their faith in the mercy of the Father to feel happy. They don't go that far. Now, check this out. This is what happens to Judas. Judas ultimately, because of what I just said, he didn't go far enough in his faith with Jesus to be happy and see his mercy. This is why Judas commits suicide. Let me just read it to you. So this is straight from Acts chapter one. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong and his body, this is very romantic marriage night type of verse. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Now, you know, there it is. That's the verse. It's very, Bible's just very straightforward. Now, Matthew 27 gives us additional context. You may have read these verses and thought, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. Let me help you. Matthew 27 says this, Judas, after he betrays Jesus, comes back to the uh, Pharisees and he's like, hey, take your 30 pieces of silver back. I feel real bad. This is what they say to him. So Judas says, I've sinned for I betrayed innocent blood. They say, what's that to us? Essentially, we, bro, we do not care. We don't care about you. They replied, that's your responsibility. Then, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. You may have read both these verses. My like, whoa, well, which one was it? Did he fall head first and his intestines spill out or did he hang himself? Which one? Both. I've been to this spot. It's interesting. For decades, people thought the Bible contradicted itself. Then they dug up this spot. Akeldama is in the Valley of Hinnom. It's at the, the, the surface of a, at the very front of a very steep cliff. Both happened. Judas hangs himself on a tree that was reportedly at the very top of the cliff. Eventually rope snaps, he falls down off the cliff, body bursts open, intestines spill out, both happen. Now, let me ask, answer this question. This is important and it relates. If a Christian commits suicide, will they go to heaven? Now, this is very sensitive and let me just answer this question. For some of you, what I'm about to say will contradict the tradition you came from. For instance, if you come from like a Catholic background, the teaching is that if anybody commits suicide, they go to hell on this basis. They say, well, then the last thing you did was murder. Murder is breaking one of the 10 commandments, which uh, is categorized as what's called a mortal sin. And because the last thing you ever did was commit a mortal sin, you can't repent because you killed yourself and because you can't repent, you'll be in hell. Now, here's the problem with that thinking. Y'all, when Jesus forgives us, he forgives all of our sin, past, present, and future. All of our sin, past, present, and future. If a person, goes, a person goes to heaven or hell based on one thing and one thing alone, their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. Now, some people have heard that. They've said, yeah, Josh, but like somebody who is truly saved, they would never actually commit suicide. I would just say that is very naive. That is very naive. Moses, Job, Elijah, Jeremiah, all of them in the Bible had suicidal thoughts or vocalized they wish they could die. Actually, let me give you an answer. Remember, suicide is a form of murder. So let me ask this question. Can a Christian commit murder and be forgiven? Obviously, yes. We've got three examples, David, Moses, and Paul. So listen to me. The death that defines your eternity is Jesus' death, not yours. That's what matters. So I just wanna say this, listen, because what I know is in a church our size, 30, 40,000 people are gonna hear this message. There is gonna be somebody that's listening to this message and you're considering this. Listen to me, you need to know this. You are not alone. You are not alone. If you're still breathing, there's still hope. The Bible says this, when, when David had his own thoughts of maybe he wanted to die, the Lord gently reminded him, Surely you shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's true for you. Surely you 
shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. However you're feeling right now, it will not be that way forever because you have a savior who can wipe away every tear from every eye and make it fresh again. He can do that for you. So listen, I I would just say this to you. Don't make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. Don't do that. Amen, church. Do we all, are we all, we, we're a family. We want to be here to help you. Get honest with somebody. Let somebody into that pit. And let me just say this, that Judas taking his life is not how Judas's life had to end. This is not how Judas's life had to end. So my favorite part, I'm, y'all, I'm gonna get weepy. Heads up. My favorite part about this whole passage is, do you remember who the dude is that's leading this whole meeting at Bible study? Who is it? It's Peter. (laughs) It's Peter. Now, I just, let me point this out. The whole passage, you remember this? Peter's going, the scripture had to be fulfilled. The reason we gotta have this dude, his name's Matthias. The reason we gotta pick somebody to to replace Judas is because y'all remember what the scripture said? And Peter was the leader of the Bible study going, we're gonna be the people who obey the word of God, who honor the word of God, who walk in righteousness with our savior. And here's why I love that so much. I love it so much. Listen, you need to know this. That's the guy that's filled with the spirit in one chapter. So let me just say this. People who are filled with the spirit of God are people who obey the word of God. Spirit of God people are word of God people. If you ever experience something that contradicts the word of God, and you're like, well, I know what the Bible says, but the spirit told me. Listen, that actually may have been a spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a demonic unholy spirit is what it was. The spirit of God will never contradict the word of God because the spirit of God authored the word of God and he operates through the word of God for hope, joy, peace, restoration in your life. That's what the spirit does. So here's, let me, the reason Peter is so insistent on, we must obey the word, we must obey the word, we must obey the word, check this out. Because God doesn't bless people, we say it wrong. God doesn't bless people. God blesses a place. The place that God blesses is under his word. You place yourself under the word of God. You bend your knee to the lordship of Jesus. You start walking in obedience to the word of God. We don't obey to be saved. We do obey to be blessed. And word of God people will end up being filled with the spirit of God. This is what we got here. So this is Peter. Now, that that was all free. Here's where I wanna land the plane. So Peter's the dude leading the meeting. Now, remember, Judas, not the only dude who failed Jesus on the night of his betrayal. Remember this. So you got Peter. Peter's original name is Simon. Jesus renames Peter Petros, which means rock or the rock. And Peter was the son of John. What that means is that like modern day, Peter's real name would have been the rock Johnson. Just had to get that in there. That's what, just had to get that in. So this is Peter. Now, Peter, biggest screw up of all the apostles This dude can't get it right for four gospels. Guy's got diarrhea of the mouth. He can't not say anything. I won't do that on Sunday either. He can't say anything. Anything that comes to his mind, he can't not say it. He's the only apostle who Jesus looks at him and goes, get behind me, Satan. You're the one. When they tried to arrest Jesus, Peter cuts a dude's ear off. That's not because he was a plastic surgeon. That's because he missed. That's what that means. So like this dude was violent. He was all these, all this stuff. But remember on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter, the Bible says was quote, following Jesus at a distance. Some of you right now, you're following Jesus at a distance. What do I think about this guy? I'm I'm gonna hang around Lake Point just a little bit. Watch out, it's gonna get on you. So what's gonna happen, it's gonna get on you and then it's gonna get in you and then it's gonna change you forever. You're, right now you're following Jesus at a distance. Jesus starts getting put on trial and the Bible says that Peter was sitting around, there are only two times in the whole Bible it mentions this, a quote, charcoal fire. So Peter's like, he's in front of this charcoal fire and this girl asks him, hey bro, like, you, aren't, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter's like, no way, man because he's afraid what's gonna happen to Jesus is gonna happen to him. And then she's like, yeah, but like your accent, you got one of them country boy accents. 
Your accent's giving you away. You got that Galilean accent, just like us, like California people got California accents, Florida people, Florida accents, Brooklyn people, Brooklyn accents. Texans are the only people who speak English perfectly. We're the only ones. We're the, that's, we're the only one. But they were like, Peter, your accent's giving you away. And then the Bible says, Peter starts, it literally says cursing Jesus. He starts cussing, that blankety blank guy, I hate that blankety blank, that guy's the worst, I hope he gets crucified. He's cursing him and he's going, would a real disciple of Jesus be cursing like this? And the second he did it, a rooster crowed and Jesus had told him. And then the Bible says, Jesus looked and like from here to the back of this room and I'm in a big room if you're watching this more, Jesus looks at him all the way across the facility he was in and locks eyes with Peter. And then the Bible says, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Now, Peter and Judas both betrayed Jesus. They had the same sin that you do. Here's the difference. Judas ran away from Jesus, killed himself, and went to hell. Peter did something very different. Do you all remember this? The morning Jesus was crucified, all these women, they're there, and they like start running around. They're like, bro, like, I'm telling you, they start telling all the guys, I'm telling you, he's not in the tomb. And because they're idiots, the guys don't believe the women and they do all this stuff. But, but you remember what Peter was the only one? You remember what Peter did? <laughs> he starts book like sprinting to the grave. Here's so Judas runs away from Jesus, takes his sin to the grave. And because he took his sin to the grave, his sin took him to hell. Peter runs straight to Jesus. Here was the difference between these two men. Judas had a religious heart and Peter had a heart that believed the gospel. This is what it was, okay? Now, somebody showed me this years ago. And right now I'm hoping this is like a sword that pierces your soul like it was for me. Here's the difference. The difference between somebody with a religious heart and a gospel heart is this, check this out. Religion says, I messed up, dad's gonna kill me. The gospel says, I messed up, I need to go call dad. Judas and Peter, they had different understandings of the character of the father. Peter understood if I can just give my sin to Jesus, he died on the cross for my sin, he's gonna erase my sin, forgive my sin, give me a new heart, wash it away, separate it from me, lift me up, redeem me. And because he runs to Jesus with his son, Jesus takes away his sin and Jesus takes him to heaven. That can happen for you. Here's the choice that stands before every single person hearing my voice. Will you run from Jesus with your sin, keep your sin and take your sin to the grave? If you do, your sin will take you to hell. Or will you run with your sin to Jesus, give your sin to Jesus, Jesus will take it away and then Jesus will take you to heaven. One of those two things will happen to every person. Now some of you right now, you've been hanging around Lake Point, you've been following Jesus at a distance. And right now you're realizing I need to cross the line of faith and go all in with him because he can take my sin away. Right now, what I want you to do at all of our campuses, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And if that's you right now, and you're realizing that you need to like cross a line of faith, give your sin to Jesus, would you just pray this prayer with me silently from your seat? Just pray it with a sincere heart. Just whisper in your heart to God, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I've lived for other things besides you first. But I believe you died for my sin. I believe that somehow, in some way, the cross counted for me. Pray this from a sincere heart. I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe that now you live to give life to anyone who would call on your name. So from this day forward, as best as I know how, I will live for you first. I receive the free gift of grace apart from anything I've ever done or anything I'll ever do, just as a gift. Thank you, God, for adopting me as a son or a daughter of a heavenly father. Now keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And if you prayed that prayer and you crossed a line of faith, maybe for the first time today to give your life to Jesus, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand in the air. Every head bowed, every eye still closed. Here's why I'm doing that. 
because something solidifies in you spiritually when you respond physically. So can you do it? Okay, count of three. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask it one. God loves you. Two, you came here for a reason today. Three, right now, right now, if that's you, you're crossing a line of faith and you're giving your life to Christ, just right now, wherever you are, hands up right now, keep them up. Like, bro, like, lock that elbow. Like, man, like, yep, yep, like, I'm coming home. Like, right now, God, I'm yours. Jesus, take my sin and take me to eternity with you right now. Man, all over the room, man. Amen, amen, amen.